our, our theme for the year, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. And uh, if we've each month we have a new verse that we memorize together. So let's see if we can remember the different uh, verses. Uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Let's say it together. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Then February we learn Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. March was Galatians 5.25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Then April was Colossians 1.10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every... Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. I thought I knew that one. And then last month, but the fruit of the righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. And so, this month we are going to study this morning and memorize Romans 15, 14. And I, myself also, am persuaded of you, my brethren, that you're also full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and Sorry, able also to admonish one another. The fruit of the Spirit is goodness. That's part of the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, so I want us to consider this morning uh, that God wants to create goodness in my life. So I want us to uh, look at verse 13 before we look at verse 14. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. So hope comes from God. We sing that song, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. He is the God of hope. Now, in the, hope in the Bible is not maybe this might happen. It's a sure thing. And we have the blessed hope in, in, in Titus. What is the blessed hope for the Christian? Resurrection. Resurrection, but actually return. it's the return of Jesus Christ. It's called the blessed hope. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The, the, that's a sure thing because he promised it, right? right? And God always keeps his word. So it's a sure thing. So hope in the Bible is a sure thing. And we are, God is God of hope. My my hope is not that, uh, that I'm going to be good or, or that you're going to be good. My hope is in God. And then he wants to fill you with what? What does it say in verse 13? Oh, no. Oh, goodness. Nope. Romans 15, 13. Joy and peace. What does he want to fill you with? Joy. You missed it. What? All joy. All joy. You see, he didn't say he wants to fill you with joy. He wants to fill you with all joy. That little word, all, is a wonderful word, isn't it? Yes. We can, we can leave that. And where does my joy come from? Well, it comes from God. These, Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy right might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. I can have full joy because I have God's joy. Sometimes I don't feel very joyous. And by the way, joy is not in a sense uh, a happiness. Joy isn't when everything goes wrong, wrong or right. You can have joy in the midst of sorrow and suffering. Because the joy is a deep sense of well-being, knowing that God's going to look after you. Can you have that in the middle of a storm? And you should have it. And that's what God wants. And he wants us filled with all joy. And then he wants us to have, what's next? Peace. Peace. 
Wow, that's a wonderful thing. Again, not my peace, his peace. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. God wants me to have his joy and his peace. So is it dependent on how I feel? No. Is it dependent on circumstances? No. Can I have peace all the time? Yes. Can I have joy all the time? Yes. Now, do I? No. Sometimes I'm missing something. Read that verse. What do you think I'm missing when I don't have peace and joy? There's something missing. That means I don't have peace and joy. It's in the verse. Something that stops me from having peace and joy. Believing. Believing. It's, I've got to believe. It's there. God's given to me. God's given me his peace and his joy. But I've got to, what? What's the word? Believe. believe. Look at Now the God of hope fill you with all joy, all joy and peace in believing. The Bible says that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, for it is evident that just shall live by faith. I have to trust God. Trust God. Lord, I don't feel very joyous right now. Fill me with your joy. Lord, I, I'm, I'm worrying right now. I'm upset, Lord. Give me your peace. Actually, Lord, you've given me my peace, your peace. Help me live it out. It comes in believing that ye may abound in hope. God wants us to, to uh, abound. What does abound mean? Exceed. Exceed. Lots and lots. Amen. We have lots and lots of hope. Um, hope, uh, let me give you a definition. Confident in future events, the highest degree of well-founded ex expectation of good. So hope is an expectation of good from God. And God wants these things. Now, how do I get it though? Verse 13. Through the power of my mind. No? How? Through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Ghost. It's through God. So, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. It's through God that I get these things. Amen? Okay, so, now, he says, and I... Verse 14, and I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. So he says, I. Well, who's I? How do we know who the I is? Who's writing this letter? Paul. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. Paul, verse 1, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. So Paul, in the books that he wrote, always put his name in it. And so we know Paul wrote this book. So when he says, I myself, it's Paul speaking. Paul says, I know something about you. Now, Paul is writing to Rome. Uh, uh, to churches at Rome. I'll talk about that in a second. Paul has not been to Rome by this time. Paul wants to go to Rome. He tells us in this book, in chapter 1, verse 10, uh, making a request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God uh, to come unto you. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be, that you may be established. That is, that I may 
be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, that oft times I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Okay, so he says, I was let hitherto. What does it, the word let there mean? English is the craziest language in the world. Let can mean to allow, or it can mean to hinder. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? One word can mean exact opposite. But right now, they're playing the French Open. Anybody know what the French Open is? It's a tennis, uh, a tennis uh, tournament. And in tennis, if you throw up the ball on your serve and you hit it, and you hit the net and it goes off on the other side, it's called a let. The ball was hindered from going on. So Paul said he was let hitherto. It means he was stopped or he couldn't get there. So Paul wanted to go to the book of, uh, go to the book of Rome. Paul wanted to go to Rome, but he couldn't go at this time. He ends up going, but how does he end up going? How does Paul end up in Rome? He ends up as a, a prisoner. He ends up as a prisoner. He wants to go, but God says, well, I got a different way for you to end up to be, being there. God's ways are, are past finding out. But Paul said, and I also, I myself also am persuaded of you. Paul wrote this book, Romans, to a number of churches. Let's go look at Romans 16. Start in verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow, my helpers in Christ, who for my life have laid down their own necks, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Greet the church that is in their house. So Priscilla and Aquila, they seem to have moved around a bit, and God has allowed them to start a church in their house. Now, we have the difference... We have the expression of house churches today. And it's a whole lot different from what the Bible says. In a, a house church in the Bible was an organized church. It had a pastor and, uh, it, it, and they were members. And we got today a house church where people just come together and meet. And that's not a church. A church has to be a church according to whose definition? God's church. And so the, it was a small church. And so that's one church. And then he says... Uh, it goes on and it breaks these people up into different groups. So it seems to uh, uh, um, seems to be like five churches maybe there in Rome that he's written to. But these churches have a testimony, a tremendous testimony. Look at chapter one again. The first thing they have a wonderful testimony of is verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So, what do the churches of Rome have a testimony of? That they were faith. They had a testimony of faith. You, you say, oh, I, I go to this church in Rome. Oh, I know about that church in Rome. You, you guys really have a really testimony of faith. Now, we'll just look at it, one at the end of the book, Romans chapter 16. Now, there are some There are some problems in the church. The church is there. Verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions of offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. 
and by good works and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Now he gives them a warning and now he commends them again. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad therefore for your behalf, but yet I would have you be wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. So now they have a testimony of faith and what is what is it no in verse 19 I almost said it out loud what is did they have a testimony testimony for in verse 19 obedience obedience obeying oh they 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 believe god and they obey god what a, you know what god wants from us faith and obedience, obedience. what a tremendous testimony this church has and so uh, let's go back and it says, and I myself also am persuaded of you. So Paul is persuaded of th that they, are, uh, they have a testimony of faith and obedience and all over the world, that church, those churches, I should say, have a testimony of faith and obedience. You know what God wants from me? That I would have a testimony of what? Faith and obedience. obedience. God wants you to have a testimony of what? Faith and obedience. And obedience. Yeah. That's, that's what God wants from us. And he's persuaded of it. And then he says something. He calls them what? Brethren. Brethren. There is no such thing as a uh, church... Uh, uh, Clergy and laity. I am the pastor. I have the office of a pastor. I am not above you. I'm a brother in the Lord. That's now the office of a pastor should be honored, but as a person, I, 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 I'm a brother. Amen. Paul didn't say, "Oh, I, I'm above you. I, I'm the I'm the I'm the uh, the apostle to the Gentiles." He just calls them brethren, and we must realize that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. That's a tremendous thing. It's a tremendous thing. And if I if I ever be proud and think that I am somebody, uh, I hope that God would humble me quickly because I'm just your brother and sister in Christ. Well, I'm not a sister in Christ. You're my sister in Christ. I'm a brother. <laughs> Sorry about that. I got that a little mixed up there. <laughs> when, I, when I put this up on the internet, I'll have to take that bar out. I'll leave it in. I, I, I'm very human. There, there just goes to show you, I'm, I'm just a brother in Christ. Now, God's given me the office of a pastor. I hold that office in, in, in esteem. I, I, I'm so thankful God has allowed me. And, and I have to have, I'm accountable for the spiritual leadership of this church. But I'm co-equal in Christ with you. And uh, I, I, it's wonderful to see that Paul doesn't uh, exalt himself. Up. Now, he says this. And I'm all... Myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness. So they have a testimony of, what, for what's the first thing I said they had? Faith, Faith and obedience. obedience. Now what's the te what else do they have a testimony of? That they are full of obedience. goodness. Paul's persuaded this of them. Remember? He, 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 he believes this of them. And he knows it to be true. That they are full of goodness. Well, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. What's the next thing? Goodness. They're full of the fruit of the Spirit of God. How did that... How? Why do they have this uh, goodness? Well, we looked at it earlier. It's through the power of the Holy Ghost. The way they, they were to be able to be full of goodness is the power of the Holy Spirit working in them. And that God wants that same thing in me. He says, notice he says, <clears throat> uh, I myself uh, am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness. Ye also, that means there's others full of goodness too, right? It's not just the church in Rome that could be, or the churches in Rome that could be full of goodness. You know what? God, God wants me to be full of goodness. Amen? That's what he wants to create in my life. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to create in my life. Now, I want to read you uh, 
Paul is, is commending them. He, he's praising them for this. Let me read you this. It is not a piece of idle, idle flattery or and compliment, but a due acknowledgement of their worth and of the grace of God in them. We must be forward to observe and commend in others that which is excellent and praiseworthy. It is part of the present recompense of future virtue and usefulness, and will be of use to quicken others to holy emulation. It was a credit to the Romans to be commended by Paul, a man of such great judgment and integrity, too skillful to be deceived and too honest to flatter. Paul was not flattering him. He was, he was giving a, a, an honest commending. And you know what? It's good to, 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 if you see something good in a person, praise it. Tell them, encourage them. Paul was encouraging them here. You understand this? He's saying this is an encouragement to them. Now they were full of goodness. Well, where does that goodness come from? Verse 13. Where does the goodness come from? From God. From God? Specifically, which person of God are we looking at here? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, remember? He's talking about the Holy Spirit earlier. And, and, and because that goodness is going to be the fruit of the Spirit. God is good. The Bible says in Psalm 100 and verse 5, For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. God is good. And He wants me to create in me goodness. Moral purity. Um... There's a fellow visiting uh, Chester Cathedral in, in England. And uh, they had a uh, visitor's book. And this guy put in it uh, after his name. And then he put B.A. and M.A. So, so the old verger, uh, which is like a, uh, a caretaker. The caretaker comes in. He was really particular about... Uh, titles in the, in the book, book and, and he says to the fellow he says where did you uh, get your BA your Bachelor of Arts and, and your MA your Master of Arts the guy said oh well I've never been to university and I I did a little more than like uh, simple English and so the, the uh, verger says well well pray then what do you mean by these letters BA and MA and the fellow says well BA means born again and MA means mightily altered <laughs> he says ba john 3 16 i've been born again and 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 ma uh first corinthians 6 uh, 11 mightily altered and that's you know what that's what god wants from me he wants me born again and mightily altered changed by the holy spirit so the fruit of the spirit comes out in my life uh bible says in first corinthians 6 11 and such were some of you but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You see, goodness was not a thing you would say about me before I got saved. Nobody said to me, oh, that, that guy's full of goodness. But it ought to be now. Amen? People ought to say about me, well, he shows love. He says, he shows joy. He shows peace. He shows long-suffering. He shows gentleness and meekness and kindness and goodness. That's what God wants. And this is what they had. They had a testimony of it. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, uh, temperance. Against such there is no, no law. But look at this. I myself are persuaded of you, brethren, that ye are also that ye also are full of goodness and they don't just show goodness but they are what full of goodness if they can be full of goodness can i be full of goodness yes amen god wants to create me the fruit of the spirit in me and that is goodness manifested always I can be showing goodness all the time. When go, things go the way I want to go, I'll show, by the grace of God, goodness. When things go the way I don't think they should go, by the grace of God, I'm going to show 
What? Goodness. Goodness. Amen. God wants to change me and I have to let him. I have, I have to let the Holy Spirit create in me the fruit of the Spirit. God wants this testimony in my life. He wants me to live a, 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 a holy life. He wants me to live a life that is pleasing unto him. We memorize this verse, Colossians 1 verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. We need to be like Tabitha, a uh, woman of good works. So we need to let uh, the Holy Spirit create in us this goodness. Philippians 1 Verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. So when we read uh, uh, about the churches in Rome here, God is glorified. So if I live a life of goodness, it should bring honor and glory to God. But they weren't just filled with goodness, all goodness, but they were filled with all knowledge now that doesn't mean that they knew everything about everything okay God is all-knowing he knows everything about everything what it means is that they knew <clears throat> not the depth of everything, but the breadth of everything. They knew all the important doctrines of God. He says they were filled with all knowledge. So they knew about the ecclesios ecclesiology. What's ecclesiology? Doctrine of the church. Eschatology. Doctrine of end times. Soteriology. Doctrine of salvation. They knew uh, these different doctrines. Uh, uh, theology. That was the easy one. Doctrine of God. And we, the big, we call that theology proper. But they didn't know those big words. I'm just trying to impress you. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to impress you. That's just what they are. But they knew all these different doctrines. All the important doctrines of God. They knew them. And they were commended for it. Therefore, God expects me to know them. Amen. That's it exactly. God wants me to know them. Don't be satisfied coming to church and, and, and just sitting. Learn. Grow. God wants me to, to know doctrine. Uh, I don't know how many times I've had Christians tell me, doctrine's not important. What? What? Did you actually read your Bible? Where in the world did you come up with that? Doctrine is immensely support, important. Theology, the doctrine of God. God wants me to know the proper thing about him. Amen? Salvation, God wants me to know the proper thing. God wants me, ecclesiology, God wants me to know exactly what is a church. A church is a, 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 it's a local assembly of believers joined together. Baptized, born again believers joined together. That's what a church is. And so uh, this church is 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 uh, they they've learned sound doctrine, and that God, they're commended for that. And we need to do this. And the, I'll just quickly finish here. That won't be too much longer. Uh, don't like to keep you too look too long. But it says they were able also to admonish one another. They knew uh, that what ad admonishment is. Uh, admonishment it means to warn or notify of a fault, to reprove with mildness. Now, the life that's not filled with goodness and with all knowledge is not in a position to admonish. What in the world do I mean by that? The life that's not filled with all goodness and knowledge is not <coughs> fit to admonish. Can somebody explain what I mean by that? 
in your own words? No right answer, but... Okay. If you don't have a life of goodness, how can you tell me uh, I'm doing something wrong? If you're a liar, are you in a position to say, well, pastor, I don't know. Did you tell the truth there? You know? If I don't have goodness in my life, how can I reprove somebody for not having goodness, right? And if I don't know my Bible, how can I say to somebody, well, you know, that's, that, that's not right. And, I, and the person says, well, show me it in the Bible. Well, I don't know where it is in the Bible. <laughs> you know, I'm not in a position, right? But they knew the word of God. And, they, and so when people were going astray, they were, were able to admonish them. They had a, and by the way, it shows that they had a love for the brethren. Uh, there is no love when you don't help somebody to grow closer to God. Uh, it's not real. Your love for the brethren should encourage them to live for God. Amen? What's, what's the best thing you're supposed to do? You're supposed to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind and love your neighbor as yourself? And so, it, 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 that's what you, you need to be able to do. And uh, Paul wrote many rebukes in his letters to the churches, didn't he? Tell the Galatians that uh, they were foolish. But you know what? He wanted them to grow and go on. And so, um, they, they were able to do it. But before you can admonish the brother, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You need to be showing goodness. You, you need to have knowledge uh, because without those, that you're not fit. Um, I want to read you this this quote. Uh, what uh, about it, it, uh, admonishing to put one another in mind to remind one another of moral, ethical, doctoral, and practical daily responsibilities. Uh, and that's what it is. And the Bible says, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. And so, uh, a person filled with the Holy Ghost will show goodness in their life and, and knowledge and, and be, be willing to, to admonish a brother when, when they're going wrong. Do you know what? Uh, we're driving uh, to seminary uh, back and forth last week, and I meant to tell my wife this, and I, I probably forgot to tell her, but I ran a red light. I just didn't even pay attention. Well, Pastor Strauss told me, and you know what? Every time I came to that red light, every time I came to that light next time, I was very careful to make sure that I saw that, that I didn't run the red light. It was good that he pointed out that I ran the red light, wasn't it? If we have to admonish someone or another, it's for their good. I don't think it would be very safe if I was running red lights, would it? So the admonishment was gentle, but it caused a change in my behavior so that I no longer did that anymore. And so uh, it was for my benefit. So Paul writes them and he's persuaded that, that they've got this, they're full of goodness, filled with knowledge and able to admonish one another. My, ask, my question to you this morning is, well, first of all, have you been saved? If you've never been born again, you need to be born again. You need to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You might say, well, I've always been a Christian. That's like saying, I've, I've always been a human being. Well, no, you were, you, you were born as a human being, right? And your born again is a spiritual birth. It's a one-time event. Where, where, where you're, it's a birth. And just like you're born physically once, you're born spiritually once. When, when you come to the point in your life where you, you see yourself as a sinner and turn to God from your sin and ask him in repentance to save you. And then, are you letting the Holy Spirit create his fruit in your life for his honor and glory? And God did it in the churches there in Rome. They were filled with all goodness. Are you filled with all goodness? And are you filled with knowledge? Let's close in a word of prayer.